This is episode 192 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Gene Expression and the Brain, with Dr. Johan Jakobson. Hey everybody, this is Daylon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you're a trainee interested in being featured on an upcoming episode of the Stem Cell Podcast, we want to hear from you. Email us at info at stemcellpodcast.com or send us a message on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast and you and your research could be featured on an upcoming episode. Today, we have Johan Jakobsen from the Lund Stem Cell Center. He's on the podcast to talk about his research on epigenetic mechanisms in the brain. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news. That's coming up. But first, are you attending the ISSDR annual meeting or an upcoming stem cell related conference? Enter to win up to 500 US dollars towards your registration fee. The contest closes on May 31st, 2021, and is open to residents of select countries only, so full eligibility rules can be found on the registration form. Visit www.stemcell.com slash stem cell conference award to learn more. All right, Arun, I'm going to start the roundup for this episode with the oids. I'm going to get the oids out of the way. We've got an organoid story, but really I think it's a concept story um, from Alon Klein, who's a real concept guy, innovative thinker, bringing big ideas into stem cells. He won the ISSCR, I think new innovator, some new guy award from the ISSCR in the conference last year and gave an amazing talk. So when I saw this paper, I was excited to be able to cover it. This is about intestinal stem cells, but using them as a model to understand homeostasis, okay? Like homeostasis in a cell type con context, organ tissue homeostasis, uh, which is mediated by stem and progenitor cells, right? And the homeostasis, the whole idea is that they've got to divide and differentiate in order to compensate for dying cells or injury um, to restore homeostasis. And there's two basic concepts uh, in terms of like mechanism of how homeostasis is maintained. There's this, the extrinsic idea where you have your niche and microenvironment, which provides both the cues, you know, molecular biochemical cues, also mechanical, biomechanical cues um, can come from the niche there and that can instruct the cells. And then on the other side of that, there's this self, there's this intrinsic capacity for cells to self-organize um, in the absence of cues from the microenvironment. And one of the big goals in understanding stem cell biology as it relates to generating tissues and organs is to understand how the intrinsic cues uh, are regulated. How does this cell intrinsic um, niche independent program of homeostasis emerge? Why? Because you know we're trying to make organs kind of from scratch here and we don't always have the fetus well we we should we won't ever have the fetus as a microenvironment or the embryo or whatever you want to call it so we need to kind of uh, lev lever these cell intrinsic uh, mechanisms for generating homo homeostasis and the intestine is a great model for understanding anything really nowadays um, in stem cells because in most mammals, the intestinal epithelium, as we know, undergoes near complete turnover every three to five days. So these cells are going like gangbusters, and that's mediated by these LGR5 positive intestinal stem cells. All right. Now, the key here why ISCs, intestinal stem cells, are such a great tool for understanding intrinsic homeostasis is because they, in these uh, organoid systems that were pioneered by the god Hans Clevers, um, they make organoids, right? We all know at this point, they're like the organoid, the, the prime organoid that started the whole thing. Um, and what they do is they create their own niche. Okay. So from a single, you can get a single intestinal stem cell can give rise to a highly structured multicellular epithelium. But what it also does there is that the cellular progeny of those LGR5 positive intestinal stem cells, they actually produce the wint and notch ligands that govern 
the uh, growth trajectory and self-renewal of these cells. Okay, so these intestinal organoids are a great model, a great platform for studying self-organization um, kind of generally. And what Alon Klein did, he's at Harvard Med School, what uh, he did in his group is that they were focused on what governs the size of these stem cell zones within intestinal stem cell organoids. Um, and first, what they did to, to get there is they improved the viability and like rely, you know, reproducibility, homogeneity of these intestinal organoid cultures um, so that they could do long term. Okay. So unprecedented lengths of time, time lapse imaging of not just a single organoid, but all multiple organoids in parallel under different conditions. Um, and doing this, they were able to show that these stem cell zones are governed by what they call fission events, fission, okay? Uh, and those are controlled by um, ions, so like the, the ion channels uh, that cause inflation uh, of the organoids. And then in response to that inflation, you have these mechanosensitive piezo family channels, okay? So the ion channels and the piezo channels. Um, and with the imaging, uh, combined with a little S, a single cell uh, RNA-seq, they showed that it's this actual mechanical inflation of the organoid that causes acute stem cell differentiation and uh, causes a swath, uh, you know, large-scale transcriptional changes that are, include upregulating this piezo-1, uh, which is a mechanosensitive um, channel. Uh, and, uh, ultimately the conclusions of the group there are that these intestinal stem cells, um, they self-organize, they, they govern this self cell intrinsic, uh, homeostasis by modulating, by creating this inflation and then responding to the mechanical strain. And that's what drives differentiation and growth. Um, and homeostasis within these intestinal organoids. So uh, a, a really nice, again, concept story, I think, using organoids as they've been used uh, widely, I think, to date, not just for generating the, the tissues of interest, but also for understanding these fundamental concepts in uh, cell uh, differentiation and proliferation. Yeah, quick clarification there. Fission not fishing events day long. I got confused for a second there. I was like, wait a minute, we're going fishing? No, taking it seriously, though, uh, it's a great model system, as you alluded to. Uh, Dr. Hans Cleavers is, of course, the god of this particular technology. Uh, I think it's neat how Paizo 1 is popping up here again. This is a master regulator of mechanotransduction. We've actually talked about it a few times previously on the show. I'd like to think that different classes of genes are master regulators of that particular class, and piezo one is definitely a master regulator of, of mechanotransduction. One limitation here, uh, those type 2 fission events, <laughs> they definitely show that they are found in vitro in these in vitro cultures, but I think one disconnect is, you know, what's the reality in vivo? They're, these are incredible systems, these organoids, but they're not perfect when it comes to perfectly re re recapitulating the architecture that you, you would find in vivo. Yes, that's fair. I think that, um, you know, ultimately the, the limitations of the organoid system um, for understanding biology in vivo, yeah, they're there. But, uh, you know, you got to you got to start somewhere, Rune. And I think uh, getting back to just the, the, the start of this, this is using the platform for uh, delving into fundamental concepts in biology. And as you started there to say that the piezo has really been coming up a lot. And I think it, it, it shows that, you know, that this well, it shows an appreciation of mechanotransduction and differentiation that I think, you know, a decade ago people wouldn't have pointed towards. And I'm really excited to see how it plays in a lot of other tissues and organs. You know me, I'm, I'm really a big fan of the blood. And I, I recall it was almost a year ago now mm -hmm. that George Escapin reported the ISSCR, this idea of PISO-1 and mechanotransduction playing a role in uh, the emergence of bona fide hematopoietic stem cells in yeah. uh, uh, ES differentiation cultures. So yeah, 
Paizo's all over the place, and I'm waiting to see that one drop. I'm hoping it doesn't hasn't fall prey to the to the um, you know the evil gods of Amatapuisis. They never let you get out <laughs> of the trenches there. You know they really have their thumb on the master regulators of Amatapoetic stem cells, and they're not letting their secrets out, Arun. So we'll have to wait to see on that. <laughs> Well, wow, that's an analogy you haven't heard before, but no, you're absolutely right. There's um, a lot we need to figure out with mechanical transduction in particular, piezo, piezo, or fission, fission. We'll figure it out one day. <laughs> but moving on to another tissue type that actually has a very important connection to mechanical transduction, we're talking about the skin. And this paper has actually got quite a bit of press um, in the popular press over the last few weeks. It's a science article Coming out of the lab of a former mentor of mine from Stanford, uh, Dr. Michael Longacre, the title of the article is Preventing Engrailed Activation in Fibroblasts Yields Wound Regeneration Without Scarring. I'm going to back up a little bit and just give a little bit of backstory. Dr. Longacre ha- is a surgeon. He is He's been doing this sort of work for a long, long time. He's been uh, focused on skin regeneration. His holy grail is figure out ways to regenerate the skin without scarring. And you can immediately imagine the applications here. Scars are those, you know, things that stick around in our bodies. And, you know, a lot of times we don't want them to be there. They're unsightly. They remind us of bad decisions or just, you know, <laughs> poor circumstances, one or the other. I have a big old scar on my left arm from a, from a burn, actually, and it's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. It's kind of cool. It's almost like, you know, a battle scar in some ways, but eh, a little bit unsightly. So what I'm saying here is not everybody wants their scars, right? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And what the Longacre Lab here, they showed that if you... Uh, take a closer look at the fibroblasts that are actually contributing to the scar formation, you can figure out ways to actually regenerate skin without a scar. And the key here is engrailed one, and activating it leads to uh, scarring. If you prevent engrailed one activation, it leads to scar-free healing. So there are basically two lineages of fibroblasts, these engrailed one lineage positive fibroblasts, or EPFs, and engrailed one lineage negative fibroblasts, or ENFs, which are not super well characterized. And what they did here in this study is they used a bunch of different assays, in vitro and in vivo, cell transplantation, transgenic mouse models, to identify that dermal ENF, or engrailed negative fibroblast population, that ultimately down the road gives rise to the postnatally derived EPFs, or engrailed positive fibroblasts. But they did a bunch of genetic manipulation here and found that it's mechanical tension. Again, we're talking about mechanical transduction. It's a very important role in regeneration, as we've covered before. Uh, if you block mechanical trans- transduction signaling with either this drug that's already in circulation called vertiporfin, which is an inhibitor of YAP, yes associated protein, you actually promote wound regeneration by these engrailed negative fibroblasts, which are scar-free. It leads to scar-free regeneration for the most part. And the other really important thing here is you're not just talking about scar-free generation of skin. You're also talking about functional recovery. You're talking about functional recovery of the skin, the overall ultra structure of the skin with like the sebaceous gland, you know, the emitting sweat and that sort of thing, and also mechanical strength. So this is really critical. It's not just a cosmetic thing, but it looks like functionally these engrailed negative fibroblasts are contributing to a more complete regeneration of the skin. And we were talking about this before the show. I mean, this drug has been around there for a long time. It's FDA approved. And if if I was a surgeon or if you know a surgeon or someone out there is a surgeon, you can pretty properly pretty easily, you know, take a next step and start perhaps using this almost immediately in uh, in scar regeneration or scar-free healing. Um, I'm sure people out there are going to give it a shot. Of course, Dr. Longacre would be the first one to tell you, we got to go through the FDA rigors. We got to go through the trials to actually make sure this is safe in this particular application. But it seems like a low-hanging fruit, don't you think, Dalon? Yes. I mean, you can imagine. You're in L.A., 
there's all the plastics <laughs> guys over there. Their their phones are ringing off the hook. You know, they're they're booking out to probably next year right now with women seeking the scar free surgery. Um, yeah, I, I, I I'm sure uh, it's going to go live, and maybe we'll have a little trial by fire in the real world, uh, at least anecdotally, uh, from uh, surgeons using it off label. But uh, I mean, the implications are tremendous. Uh, it's not just cosmetic surgery, as you said, mm -hmm. but I wonder about things. You know, there's this whole idea of uh, the mechano transduction, and and I, I remember reading a, 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 the article about this uh, story where Longacre actually was quoted saying, "Because mice generally have loose skin, so they have to like kind of create yeah. an apparatus to right. to simulate the stretchiness uh, in you know in in humans." Um, so yeah, that that mechanical force is a big part of it. I wonder, as you start to say, you got that terrible burn, burn um, that you got a scar, a lot of bad decisions in your life, probably not that many, but a few at least. Um, I wonder how this type of thing would work uh, over a large area in, in the yeah. case like that. Um, if the mechanotransduction is really critical to mechanism, I, I don't know if it's um, the same situation there where you have a burn over a large area of the body. But regardless, I mean, the implications are tremendous. Yeah, definitely. And I'm glad you alluded to the the disconnect there between mouse skin and human skin. Human skin is very tight. And uh, they're saying, if you really want to take the next step here, you got to test this sort of discovery and this application and perhaps another animal model with tight skin pig being the ob obvious next application. So uh, still a lot of work next that's remained to be done, but you're right. I'm sure folks down here in Beverly Hills are taking a close look at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they did say uh, they're already moving into the pig. So that's right. You can imagine. And uh, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, another story out of California. And I, I like this story, actually. It's in Cell Reports. Um, it's pretty straightforward, although an important, I think, another concept uh, that was that that came out of this that's important uh, fundamental insight here. But it's it's I just want to talk briefly about the the place that it was done. This is a story by uh, Jacob Kimmel and David R. Kelly, who are at uh, Calico Life Sciences, which is like this kind of Bell Labs uh, in San Francisco, sponsored heavily by Google, where it's like an industry type uh, environment. But they they uh, pursue, uh, I think, targeted, uh, deliberate, therapeutic end points, but uh, with t uh, freedom that you would typically see in more academic institutes. So I was glad to see uh, industries pumping out papers at a high profile and sell reports. This is about um, myogenesis and muscles and really bigger picture. It's about aging. OK, so aging is defined pretty much as progressive functional decline and ends with death, right? We know that. Um, and all the organs age to varying degrees and there's a progressive decline in, in muscle, at least in mammals, you get decrease in muscle mass and uh, decreased ability to respond to insult, less regenerative potential. And this has all been attributed to kind of cell intrinsic changes in the muscle stem cells, uh, also in these fibroadipose progenitors, okay, so uh, FAPs. And also there's the microenvironment has something to do with it, right? So there's cues from the microenvironment change. We talked last episode about the bone marrow and aging of the blood um, and how that's governed in part by microenvironment. Same thing in the muscles. The microenvironment starts to deteriorate and you don't get good self-renewal, right? But the question is, how uh, does differentiation affect that last loss of capacity? If you have a, a, a decrease in the potential of a muscle stem cell, is that, does that bear out across the differentiation trajectory? Or alternatively, do you have kind of occult uh, aberrations in the stem cell that only emerge once uh, the, they differentiate? And this is reinforced by studies in, in T cells that shows that in aged T cells, it takes a immunological stimulation. So you got to activate them in order to elicit the age related changes that otherwise are, are latent. Okay. So what, um, 
Kimmel and Kelly did here is they used a single cell to look at the muscle stem cell and their derivative populations and the fibro adipose progenitor and their derivatives um, and looked at them across differentiation in a pretty, you know, binary study in old, young, uh, in differentiated and undifferentiated. Uh, and uh, what they found was that differentiation indeed increases the magnitude of the change in muscle stem cells and the fibro adipose progenitors. Um, but on the other side, so yeah, as they differentiate, these, these differences are unmasked. But um, on the other side of it is also what I thought was interesting is that you'll have some age-related changes in the progenitors that some uh, that ultimately are masked as they differentiate. So you get both sides of that. Uh, and looking at you know the RNA velocity, the trajectory analysis, they show that the the muscle uh, stem cells they follow the same trajectory when they're aged as they do when they're young. Um, initially, but they stall uh, during the or near to the final commitment decision. Okay, um, and they also from that conclude that the commitment, the fate differentiation, fate commitment decisions um, are also delayed as the myogenic cells, uh, the muscle stem cells, get older. So I, I like this study because it shows that industry is still, you know taking a swing at these kind of academic fundamental questions, but with the, with an eye towards therapy, you can imagine the, the applications of understanding how the, the muscle stem cell, the disparity between the muscle stem cell and their derivatives, um, and how you might target that therapeutically. And, but more importantly, again, getting back to like the, the first story that I, I covered, I think, and I like these sort of approaches where they, they use a platform and they try and get at fundamental ideas that may be applied outside of this uh, tissue that they're specifically looking at. I mean, alone is trying to figure out fundamental ideas using intestinal stem cells, but that could apply to all organoids and or tissues. And here in the muscle, you can imagine that the same um, phenomenon, we know it happens in the immune system, but I wonder how many other tissues it might occur in. For sure. And if you're going to allude back to the first study, I'm also going to allude back to the first study in terms of the same criticism that I had. Sorry, I didn't want to poo poo this too much, but got to bring it up. The disconnect between the in vitro and the in vivo, right? They even straight up said the age related changes they identify might not account for the complex interactions with the other cell types and the systemic environment that occur in vivo. But I think the the one thing that is beautiful about these in vitro differentiation systems and these in vitro systems is that if you're looking for a cell intrinsic effect, then I think it's a very powerful model because as you know, in an in vitro system, you're isolating all those other var variables. You just have the cell independent of the niche and everything else that would contribute to the actual functioning of the cell. But if it's a cell intrinsic mechanism, then I think this is a really good model system. Agree. Agree. And unlike a lone study where I don't know that you could really go in vivo with organ, it's like there are no, you know, it's not the same phenomenon that you could find in the intestine. It's in the context of the meta. You're not going to get these individual stem cell zones. But here, on the contrary, I could imagine that you could have, a, a, you know, a couple more figures here, ideally where you, you start to really unpack the conclusions you made from your in vitro system and see if they have an impact in vivo. I don't know exactly how you would do that, but um, hey, you know, you're the one that was criticizing it. Maybe uh, you could go knock, <laughs> knock on their door over there in Calico and tell them what they're doing wrong. Um, but yes, perhaps that's why this is a cell report study and not a cell stem cell study, but still, I think uh, a really, a really nice insight that I enjoyed. Hey, I'm an in vitro biologist, okay? So I got nothing against the in vitro system. I just got to call out the limitations. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing that. You know, I have liberty to do that. But no, fantastic work that they're doing at Calico. And like you said, it's a, it's a unique model for a, a next generation of research institute that's got, in some essences, I would say a blank check to do amazing science. So mm. I wish we all had blank checks to do amazing science. But moving on to the last paper that we're going to talk about in the roundup, something very different from the other stories, but 
very similar to stories that we've covered recently on the show. As you figured out by now, chimera work. Human-animal chimera work is absolutely exploding. We talked about the skeletal muscle chimeras from the the Gary lab a couple weeks ago. We talked about some of Jun Wu's work that he showed at ISSER. And this is actually another paper that Jun Wu is on. Um, Last author here is actually Juan Carlos Belmonte from down there at the Salk Institute, San Diego. First author is Tao Tan, and the title of the paper here in Cell is Chimeric Contribution of Human Extended Pluripotent Stem Cells to Monkey Embryos Ex Vivo. Yes, we are talking about human, non-human primate chimeras. All right, we're not talking about Planet of the Apes or anything like that. That's way down the road, but that's inevitably what people are going to talk about in the general population. And this study did create quite a stir in the general public because – Yes, you are mixing human and monkey embryos at a very, very early stage. Basically, you're taking these enhanced potency stem cells, which I think are very similar to the naive state stem cells that, say, Dr. Hanna is working on over there uh, overseas. You take some of those enhanced potency stem cells, introduce them into monkey blastocysts. These are macaques, I believe. And indeed, they can integrate and they uh, do contribute to the formation of a human, non-human primate, early embryo chimera. They only took these things out to about day 20. Of course, there's significant ethical limitations for carrying these things long term, so they're not going to do that. But if nothing else, it's a proof of concept to show that, yes, human, non-human primate embryos can be chimerized. One thing I did, again, want to allude to was the overall inefficiency of this process. Again, we're not getting to Planet of the Apes anytime soon. They took 130 macaque embryos and introduced the the human pluripotent stem cells in there. And really, they were only able to carry three of them to day 20. So again, extremely inefficient process, but theoretically, it is possible to generate chimerism between um, these species. And the thought here is that if you can generate human monkey chimeras, that's it's really important to consider because down the road we we have these grand fantasies in the field of creating humanized pigs with say uh, a human organ with a, an otherwise wild type pig, and that's extremely difficult because evolutionarily those species are very very distant. But it's showing here that maybe it's a little bit easier for evolutionarily uh, related species like obviously the human and the macaque. So a basic science study, basic science study, I want to emphasize that, but it's an important, I think answering an important question in this field. Yes, I think it's a, an important question. I, ha- having done some chimera stuff myself, uh, I appreciate how, how challenging it is, how fraught it is. Um, and I think this is important that they've, they've gotten to this point. I'm, I'm really anxious about what, what you do next, honestly. And I have doubts about the long-term value of human, non-human primate chimeras. Um, well, the value is, is there. I don't want to, you know, don't get me wrong, but, um, I guess the value to the to the headache slash cost controversy yeah. ratio. Right. I don't know that that that's ever going to reach a threshold where this is done in common practice, but it's done now. It's done. We've done it. We can point towards and say it's doable. Uh, I just wonder what's next. I mean, now that you've come to this point, I would say that's the final, you know, the not the final barrier to come down or the final controversy, but like. You know, it was human in a mouse. Oh, a mouse walking around having babies that are human. Yeah, it's not really plausible. No one's really taking that seriously. A mouse with a human brain. Oh, no. Pig. We talked, we joke about it. A pig will have flimsy human muscles, right? Um, yeah. yeah. All these things, they, they're kind of like a joke. But now with the primate, it's, you know, nobody's laughing. And going beyond 20, 30, I don't know. I just don't know, Arun. I'm very anxious about this, although I applaud the work. Yeah, I totally get it. I mean, this is stuff that no matter who you are it 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 does raise questions you know you, i think there's two sets of folks when it comes to this kind of work there's folks who really you know appreciate it and really want to push forward even the basic science and those who just are 
saying, yuck, we should not pursue this any further. Why are we even doing this in the first place? I, I totally get it with the pig. Perhaps there's a downstream application of generating a, a chimerized pig with human organs. But for the for the monkey, you're right. I mean, the, you just almost don't even want to think about the next steps, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and maybe this is it. Maybe this is the last step. Maybe this is the end point. But something tells me that we're going to see more of this work. And the only thing standing in the way, actually, is just how tough it is. I mean, Jun Moon knows what he's doing. He's been doing this his whole career, not to mention all the other people there technically. But I mean, 132 embryos, that's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, the amount of work that had to be done and the amount of animals that needed to be, you know, experimented on. Risky. Uh, anyway, probably won't be the last time we talk about it. So we'll just wait to the next time. Before we get to our interview with Dr. Jacobson, I have a message from Stem Cell. This is uh, maybe pertains to our monkey human chimera. Neuroscientists looking for more predictive power in their disease models are increasingly adopting human pluripotent stem cells in their research. Stem Cell Technologies offers products, protocols, and training to support HPSC-derived neural models. Explore their collection of technical videos and webinars on neurological disease modeling by visiting www.stemcell.com slash neural disease model. Guys, you can do it in vitro. You don't have to make a chimeric monkey. Go ahead. All right, guys. Today on the show, we are welcoming Dr. Johan Jokobsen, who is the director of the Lund Stem Cell Center and professor of neuroscience there. Dr. Dr. Jokobsen's lab is interested in how gene expression is regulated in the brain and how this process influences neurodegenerative diseases, psychiatric disorders, and brain tumors. Their current focus is to study the role of epigenetic mechanisms in microRNAs. Their technical expertise include lentiviral vectors, transgenic mice, and stem cell cultures. Projects include studying molecular mechanisms that control transposable elements during brain development, functional analyses of microRNAs and their role in neural stem cells, how autophagy contributes to the pathophysiology of neurodegenerative disorders, and the development of new gene therapy tools for the brain. Wow. I just like summarized all your lab's work. You don't even need to be on the show anymore. Dr. <laughs> Jacobson, thank you so much though for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. So like Dale mentioned, you do a little bit of everything. You're using a variety of molecular tools and approaches to study diseases and disorders of the brain. And so we'll get to the viral vector work in a little bit, but I think one of the most exciting areas of study that your lab's focused on is the role of transposable genetic elements or transposons. And I think a lot of us forget about the importance of these so-called transposons, their jumping genes, as they're colloquially called. And your lab is looking at their evolutionary impact on brain development. So tell us a little bit more about your folks. Your work focusing a little bit more on these uh, transposons in brain development and what your work can tell us about the evolution of the primate brain. Well, I mean, transposons is, a, is, is the major part of our genome. It makes up more than half of our genome, at least. But I really understudied elements and... Um, I mean, it's been known for half a decade that these elements can contribute to gene regulation by acting as sort of genetic elements that contribute to promoters, enhancers, repressors. But it's sort of been forgotten in terms of mammalian biology. It's not just until recently that they have sort of been reinvigorated where there's a lot of new studies and lots of new ideas on how transposons influence our evolution and perhaps also our disease. And they are fascinating because they are very, if you look at the human and chimpanzee genome, for example, we have a very similar protein coding part of the genome. But if you look at the transposable element uh, part, there is quite a lot of difference between human and chimp, for example. Hmm. So, the, so the, I mean, at least the information is potentially there uh, and that they contrib contribute to the audience. That, of course, to, to prove and study this aspect, that's challenging, right? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Evo Devo, as they call it, isn't new. Uh, on the contrary, we've been looking to developmental models. I mean, that's basic, right? We look to the developmental models for insight into the human complexity. And we've been doing that since the beginning. Um, but recently, you know, we're a stem cell show here. And recently, a lot of groups we've been covering on the show, these 
uh, investigators like Madeleine Lancaster, Alison Watry, Sergio Pasca, uh, who've all leveraged neural organoids uh, toward interrogating the developmental attributes that make human brain development unique. Um, do you see a uh, potential to use these kind of organoid models to study transposable elements? Um, you know, how would you, if so? Yeah, I think, well, actually we are doing it at the moment. So there's two aspects that we're doing. We're either looking at human and chimpanzee organoids to compare uh, differences in, in transcriptional activity of these, these type of organoids and how this can reflect to the composition of, of transposable elements. So let's say that you have a transposon insertion in an intron in one gene, and that transposon insertion is only found in human and not in chimp. Does that alter the expression of that gene? Hmm. Uh, and of course, then with organoid modeling, you can then really sort of edit that uh, element out and see if that then that that sort of reverts transcription back to the chimp state. Yeah, we love new technologies on the show. You talked about organoids, and it seems like everybody's working on them, your lab included. But in addition to organoids, there's, of course, single cell, CRISPR, and so on. So many exciting new technologies. But your lab has actually taken a focus on a more old-school technology, lentivirus, right, as a way to effectively deliver gene therapies to the brain. And I'm not an expert on the topic by any means, but it seems like there's this competition between the AAV and lentivirus folks to figure out the best way to actually deliver some of these gene therapy and CRISPR components to the brain. So what's your take on that? Do you think, what, what do you think is the best way to actually safely and effectively deliver tools like CRISPR to the brain? Uh, well, I mean, I'm not completely up to date on this country. So we don't really do human uh, based therapies development in my lab, but, but we work both with AAVs and lentiviral vectors. And I mean, as you, as you might have noticed, AAV seem to be, more broadly used and more popular at this stage because of certain you know, entities of that type of vector. So I think that's most likely, and I guess there is already AAV CRISPR based therapies that will be tested in humans. So it's certainly going to happen soon. We do a lot of lentiviral work in the lab to do experimental sort of CRISPR based deliveries because they're very easy to work with and they're very effective. To transfer to human setting, it's a completely different scenario, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're alluding to it there. It's not exactly your point of emphasis in the lab, but I mean, your, your roots and your pedigree, uh, are quite, I mean, are deep, let's say, in Lenti. Your postdoctoral mentor, Didier Trono, um, he's like a god in the field of lentivirus. Everybody who's ever used lentivirus knows the name because they got to reference him in the index, right? Um, and he's well appreciated as a pivotal influence in the development and, and kind of like leveraging it, uh, to use it as a tool. Uh, and of course, there's no question, you just said it's easy to work with. So there's really no question that the scientific impact of lentivirus and a lot of derivative methods for delivering gene products to cells is immeasurable. But I know you said this isn't your point of emphasis, but nevertheless, I'm going to wade into it clinically speaking. Applications for lentivirus are not as widespread. I know in terms of like safe harbor therapy for hematopoietic uh, disease, gene targeting um, for disease and hematological malignancies, that, that's a thing. Um, but clinically, the, the tools are not as, I guess, wide, widespread in their application. Um, so, you know, again, I know it's not, maybe you're not up to date, but just in your mind, you're working with it in the lab and understanding the principles, do you think the therapeutic, the, the, the days of therapeutic application of lentivirus are still in the offing? Are they still to come? Are there, are there going to be new uh, viral delivery mechanisms that, that are going to need to be developed um, that are like, that are going to address, is there a fundamental safety concern with the lenti that you think you can't get around? Are there like neurotrophic viruses like the Zika virus that are still yet to be developed? Uh, that's a lot of things there, but could you just give us, you know, your take on therapeutically speaking, what the the limitations and or uh, p unmet potential of, of viral therapy is? Well, I think if you look at if you look at lentiviral vectors, there's two aspects which are challenging. One is, of course, the safety concern that you have a, an integrating vector which is derived from uh, potentially HIV which causes concern among, amongst many people. And then there is the aspect of the production 
possibilities. And, and lentiviruses are, are, of course, this budding retrovirus type, which is surrounded by a cellular membrane, which makes them challenging to produce in, in really high purity and high quantities. Hmm. And that's the drawback with lentivirus. The production could probably be sold quite a lot. And the safety, from my point of view, it's just a theory. I mean, I don't think that is a real concern, at least if you compare to other vector systems. So the, the safety of lentivirus has been tested for I mean, more than two decades now that it's a safe system. So I think that there could perhaps be a, a spur of new lentiviral uh, sort of trials and protocols because they, of course, can encompass the whole CRISPR system in a much better way than AAVs. Hmm. Uh, and then I guess there is also perhaps some commercial aspect of this, which 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 seems to be extremely important these days in in how we, which vector you choose. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think any of, of this. I think what what we will see in the future is is more and more synthetic synthetic versions of AAVs, because they are popular tools and you can make them synthetic and, and more effective. And they have, of course, the advantage that, that it's a non-pathogenic virus. I see. Yeah. It's an extremely hot area of study, ways to figure out gene delivery to different in vivo systems, but really bringing it back to more of the the pure basic science, in addition to lentivirus and all the stuff, other things that your lab is focusing on. Your lab's also focusing on autophagy, which has also become a very hot area of study in the last decade or so. So autophagy, as we know, is this cellular self-eating process. And in particular, in stem cell biology, it's become a really huge area of interest because it's a way that cells can refresh or renew themselves. And perhaps for stem cells, it's really is critical to their downstream function. And it also contributes to the pathophysiology of different neurodegenerative disorders of the CNS, the central nervous system, such as Parkinson's or Huntington's, which is what some of the work that you're focused on. But a lot of folks don't realize that there's actually a really strong link between autophagy and intracellular transcriptional control, which is actually something that your lab has focused on. So tell us a little bit more about how autophagy, this amazing process, can really impact the development of different neurological disorders and the tools that your lab is using to, to study it. Well, I mean, we became interested in autophagy initially by the observation that um, autophagy seemed to be crucial to sort of um, process or degrade empty uh, risk complexes. So basically, the microRNA pathway, of course, depends on the, on the risk complex to silence uh, uh, messenger RNAs. And this is an extremely titrated protein complex, which is really controlled at the post transcription level. And autophagy seems to play a key role there. And basically, if you, if you block autophagy, you seem to really lose the, the precision of the, of the microRNA pathway. Uh, and I think there's, I mean, then of course there's been a lot of observations that autophagy is impaired in a lot of neurodegenerative disorders. So we're trying to understand uh, what's the reason behind this impairment and what's the consequences. I mean, it's been classically been linked to protein aggregates, which is something you have in, in neurodegenerative disorders. But I think our data from previous studies and ongoing work really supports the notion that this is not linked to the, the aggregates. The aggregates might be consequence of this, but, but they have nothing to do with the impairment and autophagy, and, and the, they might not also be the important part of the pathology as a, as a consequence of that. Because as you said, autophagy controls really key processes in a cell, and in a, particularly in a neuron. And if you lose that process, you will have severe consequences to cell fitness, basically. Staying on the... Um neurodegeneration and disease angle for a minute, but I'm trying to connect the dots with development. So I'm, I'm looking at this recent story you had in the EMBO journal, and it seems like deletion of TRIM-28 results in heightened activity of endogenous retroviruses, and that leads to increased neuroinflammation, right? But that's like a developmental phenotype, um, and I get that. The link between the epigenetic element, the endogenous retroviruses, and I could see that put in the framework of like evolution in terms of species differences, how that's relevant for neurodevelopment. But connecting it to disease, I just want to ask if you're also investigating a link uh, with these endogenous retroviruses and neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. And if so, if there is a link there, is it the idea that um, aberrant uh, processes and neuroinflammation during development can lead then in later life 
to neurodegenerative disease? Or is there possibly that, there, maybe this is a dumb question, but is there any kind of mobility of endogenous retroviruses even in postnatal stages that may contribute to disease? Yeah, I mean, we, so we made this observation that if you, by using genetic mouse models, activate expression of transposons, or in this case, endogenous retroviruses, this, and if this happens during brain development, you, you in, in adult brain, you end up with neuroinflammation, which sort of suggests that this act may act as triggers of neuroinflammation in various disorders. Because, of course, these elements are controlled by epigenetic mechanisms. And if you have dysregulation of epigenetic mechanisms, such as DNA methylation or histone methylation, it might actually activate these elements. Mm. And so we are currently trying to follow this up in the human situation by doing sort of post-mortem studies to sort of try to figure out if we can detect aberrant activation of transposable elements, if this is linked to altered epigenetics, and if this is also linked to sort of an interferon response or an inflammatory response in the same type of cells. Hmm. This is technically challenging, I should say, because it has to be done at a single cell level in a, in a post-mortem brain tissue. Technically challenging, but I believe your lab is up to the challenge. You're at Lund University, which is one of the greatest institutes of higher education in the world, actually. It's located in beautiful Sweden, of course, located at the southern tip of the country, just about an hour's drive from Copenhagen in Denmark. Now, I'm not going to be I'm not pretending to be an expert on the geography of Sweden, okay? But I do know that Lund is far, far from Stockholm, which is where the ICCR annual meetings are held and Nobel Prizes are awarded, yada, yada, so on, right? But your university has recently established itself as a powerhouse for stem cell research as well, in part thanks to your leadership. And we constantly seem to cover papers on this podcast coming from your school. So for us ignorant Americans who don't know much about your school, tell us about the university and why you think it's an amazing place to be a stem cell biologist. Yeah, so Lund University is a, it's, it's, it's a, a rather large university. It's 40,000 students. And it's located in a small town, so it has this sort of small university town feel. Uh, um, and of course, uh, neuroscience and stem cell research has been a core part of the research at this university for the last few decades. And I think our center, at stem cell center, it's it's really a nice place, actually. It's, it's really um, it's really benefits from the small town uh, feeling, and as well as to being part of a big university. Well, I have to uh, just take an issue with Arun's reference of ignorant Americans. I haven't been ignorant to the glory <laughs> of Lund University as, as much as he has. I've been I've been hearing about Lund since forever. You know, since you know eighth grade bio, Carl Linnaeus. You know him? Alumnus of Lund University. Some people probably didn't know that. I know you did, Johan. Um, I don't, no, I don't, I don't think he's from Lund. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he spent a minute there at least. I mean, yeah, it's, I'm been, sure it, it, it's, check it out on Google. I did. If I'm honest, that's how I found that little kernel of information. He spent a minute at Lund, Johan. I'm sure he did. He did. Yeah. He did that and he did the binomial nomenclature that we all love. But Lund is, you know, this is on Google. Check it out. A lot of things have come out of Lund. Ice Age Theory, that's a big one. The first respirator, medical ultrasound, Nicorette, for all you smokers out there, couldn't have done it, couldn't have kicked it. Without the uh, without the Lund people, the inkjet printer, <laughs> uh, Bluetooth. I mean, the list goes on. I'm going to stop right there. But if you have to add one, you know, one thing, no pressure there. But what's the next thing that Lund's going to be recognized for? I know we talk about all these stem cell papers coming out of there. If you had to add one of those to lists that you aspire towards or you think is already uh, worthy of recognition, what what would you what would you put on that list? Oh, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, Lund is. It's true. I have no idea. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough place to be. I mean, what's like, nice about our center is that it's close to the hospital. So there's a, there's a, been a tradition that you can bring therapists directly to the to the patient. I mean, this was the place where the first neural transplants was made, for example, in the 80s. Hmm. And I think that's still the, the sort of strength of our center. That it's really close to the hospital. It's it's really a possibility to do translational stem cell science. Yeah, I think some of the best places to do research in the world are those institutes that have 
everything right next to each other, whether it's an amazing medical center right next to an amazing basic science department. And that's kind of what it sounds like you have there at Lund University. So thank us, thank you so much for joining us here today, Dr. Jacobson. And we're going to let you go in a second here, but we're going to ask you some science peripheral questions just so our listeners can get to know you a little bit better. So the first question I'm going to ask is, if you were not a scientist, what would you be? Uh, I would probably be a writer. I would hope to be a writer. That would be great to write books and novels. I guess you don't count writing scientific publications as writing? <laughs> All right. Not no. quite as stirring. <laughs> would it be fiction? You'd be a fiction writer? <laughs> I think I would, yeah, I would love to be a fiction writer. Wouldn't that be nice? Are we talking some of these dark, you know, <laughs> that the Swedes have a reputation for a particular type of uh, procedural? Is that what we're talking? What, what, <laughs> oh, what, what genre? No idea. <laughs> Just some deep, some good, some something fictional. And it's always nice to escape from the hard reality of science, I guess. Grass is always greener. Yeah. All righty. And the last question is, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given, professional or not? Well, actually, I think it's if you, if I um, well, at least in the discussion of science and and science career, the best option has always best advice has been that if you miss one option, there's always another option waiting for you. Hmm. It's kind of like the uh, God closes the door, open a window. But I mean, I don't like that. That that means that there's a higher power. I like your your version so much more because there are so many options in science, so many unknown truths out there, which is why we're still, uh, we still get paid, I guess. Although sometimes as a young scientist, at least as a scientist who's maturing, it seems like we've run out of good truths. Last question. What do you think? Are we running out of good truths, Johan? Or are there, are we are more unknown than known out there in science? I think that's far more unknown than known, right? A lot of good truth out there. All right. Thank you for that. And thanks for this chat. This has been a lot of fun. Arun Johan, we'll get him in a couple weeks. Great. Thanks a lot. All right. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. You guys, come on. Send in your links. Send in your info. We would like to get you on the show talking about your science. Until then, we're going to be in between. Tune in a couple weeks. Thanks for listening, guys. Mm -hmm.